Good, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Saturday Lightning Talks. Um, we're just going to start up in a minute. Um, just a quick announcement. We are in need of volunteers for all areas. Um, and if you think you have some time to volunteer, please head up to the volunteer tent after the, the Great Lightning Talks, obviously. Um, and we will be tasked doing AV or odd jobs or something. Okay, so first up we have the Coder Dojo. Um, is the speaker here? Okay, so last up we have the Coder Dojo. <laughs> And um, all things under a dollar. Yeah. You must start now. Okay, hello everyone. Um, this is about Android Mole, um, and I'm just going to share with you, um, if you like this kind of stuff, some technique that you can use to identify Mole um, at runtime, which is quite different as to how we normally do it. So, these are just some headlines. Um, Mole is a problem um, in the Android space, um, and it's not just a couple of infections here and there, it runs in the scale of millions and hundreds of thousands. Um, if you own an Android device, you probably have been. Uh, effects about this at some point. If you think you haven't, then you just don't know about it. Um, so typically we look at malware in a couple ways. Um, I won't go into the technicalities of these, but generally these rely on some sort of analysis of artifacts, uh, be it that application itself, an APK. We look at signatures, reputation, one of my favorites, um, which is kind of that screenshot on the right, uh, which is a free torch app. Um, and generally you say, if it's for free, you are the product. Um, so especially on the App Store, a lot of these apps are saying, hey, this is free Pokemon Go, or you know, free Monero mining. Um, that's probably going to end badly for you. Um, and then memory forensics, uh, which is quite common, but that generally happens after post-infection. So what are the shortcomings uh, with this? Well, any of you have delved into reversing, um, static analysis is hard, so either you have to be a ARM expert or know Dalvik opcode or know the Android runtime quite well, which is quite hard. Or I find it hard. Um, you can't run things like Cuckoo on your phone. If you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. You can Google it. Um, but typically, the current analysis techniques only show you a very small subset of what the malware actually does. Because malware is really good at hiding what it does. And at the end of the day, static analysis won't show you 100% of what you're going to look for if you want to see a nasty piece of malware. So we want to look at the memory at runtime. Um, this is a bad Linux joke in a way, but if you really want to uh, torture yourself, uh, look at a thing called Proc PID Max. That's a little memory list for a particular process in Linux. Android is Linux. And uh, if we really want to hate ourselves, we can look there for objects on the heap. Um, and this technique, uh, basically what we want to do is look at objects on the heap. Because every piece of malware makes use of objects, they're not making use of raw primitives. If they were, they would be cool, um, but they're not. And we want a way to look at what objects are instantiated at runtime for a particular process. Either we can look at things like property maps or 5GDB and look at it quite manually. Or we can use an awesome tool called Frida. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend you look at it. It is a great instrumentation framework. And basically, it allows us to look at a process at runtime while it's actually running on the device and you can look at everything from uh, system calls and more interestingly looking at the memory of a process. So for example, a um, common technique is to backdoor applications with something called interpreter. Uh, it's quite funny if you want to troll your friends if they install apps not from the app store. And you want to look at two kinds of things, typically a DAX class loader or a TCP connection. Uh, you want to basically look for does this app inject additional functionality at runtime, which is a very common technique, and does it establish some sort of outbound communication. 90% of the time malware will make use of these two techniques, um, and this is often missed by static analysis because any functionality that is important from the DEX class loader, you will not see with static analysis. You have to actually invoke it at runtime and to see this actually happening. So 
I wasn't doing any live demos and I was lazy and got some links here to some videos. If I can remember how to compute it. And I think it just did it there automatically, also magically. Um, so basically what's happening here, we're just going to do a standard infection. This is nothing new. This is typically what a uh, evil computer would look like. Um, and what we've done over here is we've backdoored the Twitter application with that thing that I was talking to you about earlier called Interpreter. It's a legit application. We just backdoored it. Um, so it'll function as Twitter. And at this case, this just shows us we have a session. So remotely, we are controlling this device over here. And from my attacker's machine, I am going to take, in a moment, a screenshot of the application and get the person's password. And this infection makes use of a bunch of objects um, to actually perform this kind of functionality. This is my evil machine over here. And if we open up that picture, we will then see the screen of the device that we had infected. Now that's all fine and dandy, and not really that interesting, it's been around for quite some time, but some of the issues that we have is how do you analyze this malware to see that it's actually doing that. So I asked myself that question, and let's see if I can compute it again for another link. There we go. So we got the same infection, and I built something called ACAC, anybody who's familiar with Dutch or Afrikaans, you know what I mean. And what we do now is we use a tool called Frida, we hook into the process, so in this case, I'm analyzing the system, these are system processes running over here. Um, I built a DBUS client for Android, um, so if anybody's familiar with DBUS, um, I'd appreciate uh, some help on that. But we're basically hooking into the process, um, of the application, and we're going to say, give me all the objects that this process is using, and from those objects, I can then look and see which ones are evil. Why? Because some of these objects you can't analyze statically, you have to see them on the heap at runtime. So in this case, the Twitter application that we're going to look at has the PID of that, and that Twitter application has been backdoored with an interpreter payload, so it is behaving like malware. And basically what happens is with this very, very ugly output, as you can see, I'm not a uh, UX designer of sorts, but we've managed to hook into the process of the malware and identify that as making use of a DEX class loader, and that DEX class loader at runtime has instantiated some TCP objects. Now this can go further into maybe your UR overlay attacks and a whole bunch of other stuff, which is really cool. Um, and with such instances, you would miss this functionality unless you got hold of the DEX uh, Dex code that was invoked by the class loader, which you don't have when you get the ADK. Normally it's remotely downloaded and then invoked. So that's a lot of fun. Um, once again, that's one of machine as well. Sure. What are the future plans? Well, at the moment, um, this works really well on ART um, and on Dalvik, but of course we are relying on Frida, uh, which is really cool, but it's quite um, cumbersome because it's using dbus to run on the daemon. So what we're actually trying to do now is actually analyze the heap allocation tables manually. This works really good for um, the Dalvik virtual machine because analyzing objects is actually really easy. They have magic strings. But ART is a different story because it uses something called JE malloc, which I have little to no experience with. Um, so if anybody knows JE malloc, um, you might be my new best friend. But that's where we're going to actually move Frida and actually bundle this into the operating system. We've done this, we've merged this into uh, the AOSP with our own custom builds and actually use this as a runtime um, antivirus scanner, basically. So you just say on your phone, hey, this app is acting a bit dodgy, tell me if it's acting dodgy, and it'll go ahead and tell you, well, yes, this is looking quite dodgy. And that is me. Thank you. Was under 10 minutes? Yeah, was under 10. That's the first one that's ever happened. <laughs> there you go. I need more hands for this. And is the Twitter do a person here? No. And computing with a touch of science and a dash of engineering?
Thank you. Morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris, and I like cooking, and I also like making things. So this is a, a short talk about something I made a few years ago, uh, Raspberry Pi controlled uh, sous vide water bath. <laughs> So sous vide uh, is a, the name for a cooking technique, and it, and it literally in French means under vacuum. And the vacuum part of it is probably the least important thing about the technique. So the idea is you put food into a vacuum packed plastic bag, and the plastic bag is there to stop it from getting wet. Because you then put the vacuum packed plastic bag into a water bath, and the water bath is at a precise temperature in order to cook the food as you, you want it to be done. So you don't actually need a fancy vacuum sealing equipment like you see on the left hand side which professional chefs might use for this technique. Uh, you can actually get away just with a Ziploc bag and sucking the air out with your mouth or a straw or something. Uh, the only reason why you need to get the air out at all is to stop the bag from floating in your water bath. Um, and you might also, if you're doing kind of long cooking, worry a little bit about oxidation if you, if you left a bunch of air in uh, the bag along with the food. So the purpose of the sous vide technique is to have precise temperature control. And especially when we're dealing with proteins, it's about making sure that we denature just the right proteins. So most cooking is actually, technically, when you get down to it, all about either breaking down long chain molecules or persuading short chain molecules to join together into long chain molecules in order to have an outcome. So if we look at the six different examples of eggs here on the screen, then each of those is only a few degrees centigrade apart. So going all the way from runny white and runny yolk through to essentially a hard boiled egg is a handful of degrees for each step. Um, and so you can go from sort of everything runny to just the yolk runny to things starting to firm up a little bit and eventually all the way to a hard boiled egg. So sous vide is one of the techniques that's covered in this excellent book uh, that I've kind of pulled up here, Cooking for Geeks, uh, which is an O'Reilly book. And, it's, and all O'Reilly books are great, uh, but this is one of my favorites. And it's kind of not a typical O'Reilly book in being about a programming language or a framework. Um, it's kind of there to uh, say how science works in preparing food. And so uh, as you go through the book, it's got lots and lots of different techniques in there that are used for denaturing proteins mostly. Uh, and sous vide's in there as just one of them. So to do Accurate temperature control in a water bath, in order to do this sous vide cooking, we need some kind of control system. So our input is going to be temperature. We need to be able to measure the temperature and measure that temperature reasonably accurately. And our output is going to be a heating element. And in the middle, we need some sort of control system. So we measure the temperature and we turn the heating element on and off in order to get that temperature of the, the water medium to be exactly where we want it to be. So the thing I put together about five years ago now uses a thing called a DS18B20 uh, temperature uh, sensor. And specifically, it's a, a one that's immersible. So you can see in the left-hand picture here, uh, most of the picture is the Raspberry Pi with a little daughter board on top of it uh, for the bits and bobs I put together. And just on the right of the Raspberry Pi is the immersible temperature sensor. These things cost about a quid on eBay, uh, and they're interfaced using a protocol called OneWire. Uh, and so a bit of what you see on top of the Raspberry Pi is just the pull-up resistor and the three wires that run from that sensor. So it's got. Uh, five volts ground and a single data line uh, that's pulled up with a little resistor. So that gives accurate-ish temperature. Uh, those things output to about a resolution of an eighth of a degree. And so that gives the, the temperature starting point in terms of the input for the control system. 
The right hand side shows where I did the water bath. And this was an old slow cooker. Uh, you can see the little bit of Subaru holding the old control system at the front of it together. Uh, slow cookers do everything that we need here in that they've got a heating element and they can contain water. What they don't do is anything like accurate temperature control. Uh, and so it's got three settings on it there. It's got high, low, and warm. And basically all of those will boil the water inside of the uh, slow cooker at some kind of uh, ferocity. So if you want to cook something at 55 degrees, just turning the slow cooker on and putting it onto warm won't do that for you. So the, the middle of this whole thing is the control system. Implemented on a Raspberry Pi, and it's running a bit of Python code to implement a control system known as PID, uh, which is proportional integrating and differentiating. So the output is it's taking the temperature and it's deciding how much it wants to turn on the heating element according to a proportional relationship with the temperature difference between where it is and where you want to be. An integral of that, so if you've got a big gap between where you are and where you want to be, you want to put more temperature into the slow cooker. But you also have a differentiation term in there because as you approach where you want to be, you actually want to ramp down so that you don't overshoot the temperature that you want to be at. So that's all just implemented in uh, a bit of Python code. And what's actually going on here in terms of output of that is a 433 megahertz remote control socket. So Maplin used to uh, sell these things when Maplin was still alive. And somebody had already created a Raspberry Pi library for that called Raspberry Pi Strog on and off. Uh, which took care of turning the, the remote controllers on and off. And the reason I did this was interfacing a Raspberry Pi directly to mains electricity to turn this uh, slow cooker on and off is kind of dangerous when you're messing around with things that are wet um, and things that are hot. Uh, and so I wanted something that was inherently safe in the kitchen environment. And so those off-the-shelf remote control main sockets uh, are pretty good, and it provides a huge degree of isolation between the Raspberry Pi itself and all of the hot, wet stuff. Anybody that's ever done anything with serious real-world control systems will know that control systems can be tricky. And so the top chart here is an example of an early run with this thing. Uh, so I was trying to get the water bath at about 56 degrees, the cooker, a steak at about medium rare. And you can see that it wound up there and shot across 60 degrees, uh, reaching about 62 degrees. So that's the steak ruined already. Uh, and then a few minutes along, you can see that there was some kind of error in the control loop and it went away to over 70 degrees. So that was the state properly ruined at that point. And uh, once that error was noticed, I kind of manually switched it off and the temperature slipped back down again. The lower chart is a better example of what we're trying to achieve here. And so in that example, I was aiming for 60 degrees. You can see that it ramped up quite rapidly to almost 60 degrees. Uh, then just bumbled along with a little bit of oscillation. It's, it's almost impossible to get all of the oscillation out of a control system, uh, but you can tune it to, to get that minimized. The remarkable thing in the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence is that these things still aren't auto-tuning. So you know, we can try and fight spam, but uh, we still can't control the temperature of a crock pot. Uh, reverse engineering can also be tricky, so my Maplin remote sockets, two of them died, and now you can't buy stuff from Maplin, so I had to reverse engineer another one a few weekends ago. And this is the output that we get from some of the diagnostic software for remote control commands, and I've had to use a, a platform called PyLite to re-engineer the system to replace Strog on and off. But perfect brisket at the end of the day makes it all worthwhile. 
and not shown here the amazing gravy that you get from all of the juices that you get in the bag when you're cooking with this technique. Thanks for the time, folks, and uh, I'll see you around for some questions. Uh, okay, up next we have the Coder Dojo talk. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Richard Taylor. I work for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. I'm here today to talk about Coda Dojo. Just first of all, quick show of hands. If one, anyone heard of Coda Dojo? Oh, great, fantastic. Who's been to a Coda Dojo? Nice. Who is a mentor or volunteer at Coda Dojo? Oh, that's not so good. Maybe, maybe after the end of it, um, I can persuade you to do that. So, for those who don't know, what is Coda Dojo? Uh, the key thing about Coda Dojo is it's free programming clubs for young people aged between 7 and 17 running local communities. The idea is like all the coding clubs that you sort of hear about, like Code Club, um, Raspberry Jams, those kind of things, it's uh, places for young people to go and learn more about being creative with technology. Uh, Code Dojo was founded in Ireland in 2011. Um, the first dojo happened in Cork in Ireland and since then there are nearly uh, 2,000 dojos around the world in more than 100 countries. And actually getting really accurate figures is quite hard, but we reckon about 58,000 people around the world actually each year benefit from Coded Dojo, coming to a regular club where they can learn more about Coded Dojo and coding. Uh, one thing you might see on the side is the word ninjas. In Coded Dojo, you know, we've kind of adopted the, the Japanese martial arts uh, sort of language and stuff, so the young people who participate in Coded Dojos, they're called ninjas. Um, it's an open source model. The whole thing about Coded Dojo is you just take the idea, which is primarily free coding clubs for young people, and you turn it into what you want. So one thing we really encourage, for example, is for people to hack our logo and their badges. You can see a few of them here. And again, that open source model really means if you're interested in anything to do with sort of technology and coding, and you fancy helping young people learn about it, you can take Code Dojo, start a Code Dojo, and um, teach those young people what you think they should know. What are the benefits of a Code Dojo? I mean, first there's the obvious one, right? You're learning to code. Um, the national curriculum in the UK, which was revised in 2015, is a lot better now in terms of actually teaching people programming skills rather than just the old-fashioned ICT where everything kind of revolved around PowerPoint. Um, but there's still, uh, we hear from young people all the time that they don't get enough real programming uh, lessons in the schools they have. My, my son's a prime example of that. Every computer lesson, he comes home and moans that he didn't really do anything. Isn't that right, Jasper? Yes, good, thank you. Um, good luck, all your participation there from your own family. Right, um, it's also a really social event, right? Um, Coding dojos are then, some people think it's going to be like a really darkened room with lots of pasty kids sitting around not talking to each other. It's not like that at all. Um, they're very vibrant, there's a real buzz in the, in the air and lots of mingling and people getting together and talking about things. I took my neighbour, my neighbour's son to Coding Dojo a couple of years ago. Um, his parents are great, they're super creative, they're really musical and really arty, but they're not really geeks, they're not really into coding and that kind of thing. So when he came to Code of Dojo, he loved it. And, and the comment he made to me on the way home was, it was really great to spend time with some like-minded people. And so that's the kind of social thing that Code of Dojo offers young people. It also offers them an opportunity to be really creative um, and to build things. Um, most Code of Dojos will start off with some kind of pre-configured activities where you'll learn some basics, like maybe lighting up an LED with an Arduino or doing some Minecraft hacking on a Raspberry Pi. But then it's really open-ended and the young people are, are, are encouraged to build and make projects that, that satisfy their own desires. And then we have this thing called Coolest Project, which is an opportunity for the young people to get together and share what they've built. So Coolest Project International um, happens every year, it's happened for the last three or four years, and it gets bigger every year. And um, you can see on the picture here, um, it's in the RDS in Dublin, and young people from Code Dojos all around the world come to show off the things they've built over the last year. Um, there are lots of product categories, so there's a bit of a competitive element to it. Um, um, I was lucky enough this year to be a judge, as you can see my t-shirt, um, and that's an amazing opportunity because I got to see lots of the great projects that young people have done. Um, it is a huge thing, right? I'd never been to Dublin um, before this year, 
Um, this is a picture I took from the front stage. The scale of it is amazing. Like 600 projects, 950 young people, all into coding, all into being creative, coming together to show off what they've made. Um, as I say, I was a judge. I was judging the evolution category, um, which is kind of the random thing where it doesn't fall into any other obvious category and it's a bit advanced. Uh, so um, that was great to see a lot of things that, that people were doing there. And this is the winner. This is Andre. He came all the way from Bucharest with the mentor who runs his, do his code dojo in Romania. And what he built was um, this cycling thing. I don't know if this movie's going to work. Uh, yeah, let's just see. Oh. And this is the movie of what he built I took on my phone. Um, basically, it was a cycling belt. So he put some near pixel LEDs into um, his belt. Um, had, he had an Arduino and a custom PCB that he'd made with the help of the mentor. And he'd written an app for his phone so that he could control this belt as he cycled along. So he could do things like pretend to be a police car by having like some nice flashing red and blue lights. He could do indicators, obviously slightly more useful to help tell people which way he was going. Um, and he doesn't show it on this movie, but he could also, um, if he had a bad experience with the driver cut him up, he could present a nice friendly message to the driver, perhaps warning them not to be uh, come so close in the future. How many slides? Swap hands, I can't use the mouse left-handed. Yeah, yeah, so um, I was just kind of blown away by Andre. I mean, first thing is he's nine years old, so this is a project he's built. He's had loads of help from the mentors there. And sometimes people criticise Cody Dojo and they say, well, you know, this nine-year-old, he didn't do the etching of the, of the PCB himself or by himself. Well, he didn't know. A mentor helped him to do it. The important thing for me is that he now knows that that's possible and he sees that as something that he could do in the future, maybe by himself. And that's what Cody Dojo for me is all about. It's about giving young people the knowledge and the confidence um, to, to build things um, for themselves and to see beyond their, their sealed up iPad that they can't really open because it's glued together. The really important thing about Code Dojo is though, just like EMF, it's all powered by volunteers. Uh, the, the people who run the sessions with the young people, the people who arrange the logistics, who do the ticketing, they're all volunteers. Um, we have a hugely impressive volunteer community in Code Dojo who help share resources, share tips and ideas, and of course get together for social events around all these projects. Um, but really, uh, my main call to action at the end of my talk is to just encourage any of you guys here, uh, if you fancy helping young people learn to be creative with technology, then have a think about whether or not you could help out at a Code Dojo. There are loads of them in the UK and in Europe. Um, if there isn't one near you, perhaps you could start one up. The process is really simple. You decide, I'm going to be a champion at Code Dojo. Um, you find some other people to help you. Um, find a venue. In the UK, libraries are a really good venue for Code Dojos. And we've been talking to lots of library groups around the country who are keen to get more young people coming into the dojos. Uh, find your dojo, plan what you're going to do at that first dojo, and then promote it. And we have a Code Dojo website that allows you to do ticketing and all the promotions um, to help attract young people to come to the dojos. And to be honest, uh, no, no Code Dojo in the UK is undersubscribed. They're all oversubscribed because the demand for this kind of thing is really high. Um, that's all I had to say. Uh, this is how you can find out more about Code Dojo, the CodeDojo.org website. Uh, if you want to sign up to be a volunteer, CodeDojo.org slash volunteer dash UK. Um, that's me. You can email me at any time. I'm always happy to talk to people who have more questions about Code Dojo. Um, you can follow me on Twitter or follow Code Dojo on Twitter or even look at our Facebook page. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, okay, next up we have an augmented reality battle game. And just a quick request for more volunteers, especially to help out with lunch. So if you're free now, we would love some assistance. recently started as a computer vision, computer vision engineer at a company called Reach Robotics in Bristol. Um, and I just thought what we do is really kind of cool, so I thought people might be interested if I came and talked about it. Um, but before I talk, I'm going to let it hopefully talk for itself.
So that guy was Mechamon. Um, there's a little one at the front here. Um, he's, our, he's our kind of main toy product at the moment. So we're a fairly mature startup now. We've been going about four years. Um, I've only been on the team five weeks, so don't ask me too many in-depth questions because I won't be able to answer them. Um, but the thing that really drew me to Reach was the fact that it's quite a progressive company and it's the kind of company where we really want to get people inspired. We're all really enthusiastic, we love robots, and hopefully that's what I'm going to get across to you today. So, Maggie Mon, this little guy here, four-legged robot. Um, each leg has three degrees of freedom, um, so he's fairly nimble. He can do little flips, he can write himself, hopefully, although he's not managed it on the grass so well. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do with this is not just have a robot that you drive around, we want to have people be able to play games with each other, so we're working on, if you've got two of these, you can battle them together, or if you've just got one, um, we're currently working on an augmented reality gaming app, which is what I'm really here to talk about, because that's, that's what I do. So, uh, this is uh, a fairly old demo of our original augmented um, reality game. So you can see you've got your metal on the bottom here, and he's fighting a virtual opponent. Um, basically, it's just a case of defending your base. And we've got the, everyone has to have a Metroid game at some point. Um, so this gives you an idea of what we're looking for. We want to control it with the phone, we want to put it in your living room and be able to play with it. Levels of optics, gaming, and augmented reality. Um, so that's cool, that, that works really well, um, and that's already there, so why do I have a job? Um, so there's, there's something on this image and something on that video that is the reason I have a job. Um, I don't know if anyone can spot what might be causing us problems with this current way that we're doing it. Any ideas? Shout at me. Uh, what about if I do this? Does that give any more clues? So what we have, the only way we can track the world with the original app is to have this special map in view at all times. And that map is only about one metre square which means that we're really limited on where we can drive the robot, what we can do, how we can interact with your space. Um, and so moving that into something where we don't need that map is where I come in. Um, the other problem is, and it's a bit more of a physical problem, is we have a robot with grippy legs so that it doesn't fall over, and we have a map that's not stuck to the ground, and the robot has to interact with the map. There is a clear problem when the robot runs on, runs on the map, moves the map, and essentially our entire game world moves. Um, so, what we're currently working on, um, this is, apart from you guys, only a couple of people have seen this video, so it's, it's very much a work in progress, is using new Markless AR technologies that are coming out on the new Android phones and the new iPhones um, that allow us to build up a model of the world and embed our stuff in it. So here we have a little virtual Mechamon. Um, our guy is the, the, uh, the silver one and he's fighting the gold one. And I have a working demo of this on my phone, so if anyone wants to play it later, feel free to come bug me. And I've also got a couple of Mechamon with me we can play with. And the idea is that we can move around your living room, we can fight, we can play the game, um, and we can embed this scenery in. So it's kind of cool, and it's kind of working. Um, there are still a lot of challenges. So my background is computer vision, and the biggest challenge with this is we now know where your living room is, that's great, but we need to know where your robot is. And we can kind of see things that look like they're moving around. But if we want to put some of those cool effects on it, like we had on the earlier video, I need to know exactly where the head is, I need to know where the legs are, I need to know how I'm moving. I need to make sure that I'm not putting my robot into uh, some scenery that we've created. And I also need to know, know that that little gold robot isn't about to walk straight through a plant pot because it kind of ruins the whole illusion. Um, so we're putting together techniques like, for example, we've got a nice shiny blue head. That's a pretty good feature. And then so you've got blue carpet. So then what do I do? So I'm currently playing around with things like deep learning and neural networks to try and model what the robot looks like. Um, but it's still kind of early days. Uh, I say it's early days, we're launching this in about a month. So it's early days, but I'm not going to sleep very much for the next month. Um, so the other thing that I just wanted to talk about is, as I say, the thing that attracted me to Reach was the fact that we're trying to encourage more people into robotics, which I make it exciting. Um, I mean, robots are kind of inherently exciting, but we want people to be able to take part and play with them in a more interactive way. So, one of the things we do is um, we're working with schools, we're working with universities, and we're trying to uh, run internships to bring people into the fold and make, encourage them to do stuff with the robot. 
And to that end, we're working on a visual programming language so people will be able to use a kind of scratch-like interface to make the robot play around. Um, the other things we have got, which have slipped my mind. Um, oh, yes, of course. So we're also putting together a Robo World Cup, uh, RoboCup 2019 platform. So hopefully, uh, come RoboCup 2019, we'll be involved with that. Uh, I think that probably covers most of it. Uh, I think um, I've also raced through in seven minutes instead of ten. But uh, thanks very much. I've got two of these guys with me to play around with. So yeah, come find me. Okay, and now for the final lightning talk of this session is artificial intelligence in BrainFuck. Hello, my name is Tim, and uh, I have a website called Mitzar.com. It's spelled with an X, and I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence in BrainFuck. Uh, just a very quick overview. Uh, I imagine most people are familiar with BrainFuck, but uh, it's a very, very simple programming language. It was designed not to be practical, but to be fun. Um, and it's very, very simple. It's only got eight possible instructions. That's eight characters that are valid. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit like programming an assembly language, but uh, even in assembly, you've got arguments and addresses, and, and you know the opcodes are, are they're quite large, you know, um, you know, 16 bit or more, and so in a way, you've got 65,000 possible uh, instructions if you've got a 16 bit opcode. Uh, in in Brave, like it's literally eight instructions that you can possibly use, uh, so it can fit onto a paper tape three bits wide. Uh, so the um, the instructions are. We've got uh, one big address space and one pointer to the address space. And uh, the first instruction, the plus, is increment the uh, cell that the pointer is pointing to. And the second instruction is decrement the cell that the pointer is pointing to. And the next two instructions are move the pointer to the left, move the pointer to the right. The dot and the comma are uh, your input and output. So that's um, dot is print the, the value of the current cell. It's normally one byte. So the value of the current cell printed as standard output to the terminal or whatever, and the uh, comma is take one byte from the standard input buffer and write it to the current cell. And if, if there's nothing in the buffer, it's normally blocking, waiting for input. Uh, the brackets are our control logic. That, that's basically all of the logic is within these, uh, these brackets, which the open bracket says, if the current cell is zero, jump ahead to the corresponding closing bracket. And if the closing uh, the closing bracket says, if the current cell is not zero, jump back to the opening bracket that corresponds to it. So the, uh, the effect is, the code between the brackets runs until the cell pointed to at uh, the ending bracket is zero. Uh, and of course it could be nested. So um, that's the language, basically. And uh, I wanted to write something in this. Uh, very few people write anything in BrainFuck because it's, it's ridiculous. But, um, I wanted to write uh, a useful program. There's a lot of programs which like just these walls of text that I think they were actually compiled to BrainFuck, uh, which is still an impressive achievement, but it's not, um, it's not quite the same thing as writing an entire program in it. And so uh, I said it's artificial intelligence. Uh, it's not machine learning. What I wanted to write was a computer opponent to uh, a game. And the game I chose was um, tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses. So this might sound trivial, but it's not. Even this uh, is surprisingly difficult. So the um, very first thing I did was uh, try and make the user interface. So the, the, the program is going to print to the terminal a little ASCII diagram of uh, the, the board. And then uh, we need to take input from the, the human and then place an X in, the, in a little ASCII diagram, then make our own move, place a, place a naught, and, uh, and then draw the board again. So um, just, just that very first bit then, let's start with the uh, choosing a number. So if you uh, just, just type a number between one and nine and put an X there, that, that should be fairly simple, right? Um, but even that, you've got, you've got to then take that, that byte of input 
and say, what's this between ASCII 0 and ASCII 9? And so I, I wrote this little program. I don't really have time to explain it. It's not very clear at all. I mean, this is what most brainfuck programs end up looking like. All of the text that's readable is just comments because everything else gets ignored. Um, this does technically work, uh, but it's completely illegible. Uh, the bit is doing a loop and doing a comparison brain flow, you, you have to basically destroy the value you're looking at. So you always have to copy the value somewhere else first. Even copying the value somewhere else is difficult. Uh, so this technically works. So in this particular case, uh, you can consider this like a module because we know, we know how much memory it uses. We know uh, where the pointer is at the end of it. And in that case, we can just kind of like plug it together and drop it into a larger program. But to write this, all I did was just kind of fiddle around with it in the interpreter, which, um, it, you know, for something any more complex than just saying, is this greater than or less than a number, uh, isn't scalable. So, um, the actual program, well, okay, so we need to decide how we're going to store this board in memory. Uh, and um, you might think, okay, well, you've got three possible states per grid location. So it could be empty, it could be an X, or it could be a naught. So let's just have 0, 1, 2 uh, in, in nine memory cells. But as I just explained, doing comparisons is really hard. So it, it becomes very, very tedious. I did try and write a program like that, and it didn't, uh, it didn't go well. So I started over and I decided, okay, let's, let's assign lots of memory as bitwise flags, just take the whole cell and just say it will only ever be a 1 or a 0, then we can use our, our brackets to do simple comparisons without, you know, if, if we know it's ever only ever going to be a 1 or a 0, the, the code becomes a lot less uh, verbose. Um, so we've got a number that the, the user has typed, we've confirmed that it's between a range, now we want to go to our place in memory, so we've used three, three cells per grid location, uh, just a flag for yes, it's empty, or a flag for no, it's got an X in it, or a flag for it's got a naught. And uh, now we want to do an indirect jump, and this is how I did that. This is, uh, I think this is a rather elegant bit of code. This is keep decrementing the current cell uh, and opening uh, a bracket until, until it reaches zero, of course, and then move three spaces across for every one of those numbers that we've uh, decremented it by. And so, you know, this, this works perfectly. So now we're, we're somewhere in the array, we can check, oh yes, the, uh, the, this cell is actually occupied, so go back to the choose a number routine, or, you know, we, we can mark it as an X. Um, but now we're lost, because we've, we've done an indirect jump, we need to know how to get back to our home position. Uh, so, well, I suppose you could do like some kind of linked list or something, but it's going to get very complicated. What I came up with was putting markers in memory. Uh, so if you consider something like this, what we're doing here is we're checking that some code will run if the value of the cell is one. So we decrement, then we do the is it zero, or oh, if the value is not one, I suppose, is the sum code. The point is, by putting a plus immediately after the bracket and then doing the same on the closing bracket of minus then plus, we leave the cell unchanged. So we can run this on, on any cell, and whether or not that code runs, uh, the cell will have the same value it had at the beginning. So we can do something like this, which is, um, this is a little bit like a glider in the uh, Game of Life demonstrations. This, what this code says is, keep going left until you hit a minus one value, um, because I've, I've swapped, swapped the uh, plus and the minuses around. So I, cho I chose minus one as like this special value that will only go in certain places in memory. So after we've done our indirect jump across, we can then run back to the minus one value and uh, know that we're at a, a known location. So I use this quite a lot in the program. Um, I've just given an example of one of the um, bits that we're doing. So this is uh, a test to say, has x1? This is one of the tests to see if x is 1. This is, uh, we move to the start of our array. We then move across by 1 to say that we're at the x flag. Then we say, is the first cell an x? Is the second cell an x? Is the third um, grid location an x? And if so, then we run the two lines in the middle there, which is run back to our reference point, move a certain position to a particular flag that we've assigned as x is 1, and set it, uh, other, and then run back to where we were before, because we've got to do a whole load of other comparisons as well, and we don't want the program to break. So this, this sort of bit of code is repeated, then it would be repeated for all the horizontals, all the verticals. 
uh, and the diagonals and to say your next is one. And uh, here's another example of that. This is, how is it a draw? So we can say, um, first of all, we set a flag to say, yes, the board is full. Then we go through every single cell and say, is it empty? Um, okay, so there's a certain elegance to that, but I'll, uh, I'll skip ahead to um, the demo, which is, I know I haven't really actually talked about the, the logic of the thing, but this is my, my finished code. It's all on GitHub and talk to me afterwards if you want to learn more about it. But here's a, an interactive demo. So I've got my little ASCII um, board there, and I, I press, I don't know, five, and I put an X in the middle, and the, the programs inside put a thing over there, and then we can press, I know, two, and it's blocked me, and then, I don't know, let's go for a seven, six, eight, and we put, oh, nine, and then put a draw. Anyway, feel free to play with that. Um, that's, uh, I'd like to talk more about the logic of the program, but I don't think I've got time this for it. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And just once again, can we thank all of the speakers today?